Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Thanks so much for being here. I know a lot of our participants are online today, and thanks to those of you who are in the room with us. And just another reminder from the Grand Rounds Committee that our planning committee has no relevant financial relationships to disclose. From here, I will introduce Dr. Victoria Konold, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington and a clinician scholar in the Division of Infectious Diseases here at Seattle Children's Hospital. She joined our faculty in 2020 after completing fellowship training at the University of Chicago Children's Hospital. Her research focuses on leveraging the electronic health record to nudge healthcare providers towards behaviors that align with best practices. At Seattle Children's, she serves as the Director of Quality Assurance and Performance Improvement for the ID Division and the Associate Medical Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship. We're so excited to have her speak with us today. Welcome, Dr. Konold. All right, thank you all for being here. So today we're going to go on a tour through uh, the world of um, uh, in infections causing bone and joint infections. Or excuse me, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, this is the last time that I had um, bone and joint pain was this big hike that I went on a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, but while we're going on this tour, we're going to take a couple of detours to talk about some related topics. Um, so we'll start with uh, clinical characteristics. We'll talk a bit about pathophysiology and also incorporate some aspects of antimicrobial stewardship. This is sort of our roadmap. These are all the different topics that we'll discuss, um, and I'll refer to this as we are um, continuing on our journey. So first, I want to start with a vignette. Um, you, for example, might have a patient who comes into your clinic, who comes into the ER. Perhaps you get a phone call about them. They, you hear from the family that they don't want to walk, and they have a tactile temperature. So uh, there's a lot of basic questions that you can uh, ask to try to really narrow your differential, and you can make a lot of progress by just asking some of these simple questions that have to do with where the pain is located, how long this has been going on, and any relevant exposures. So first, when asking where is the pain, if there is back pain, you're going to think about whether or not they might have a vertebral osteomyelitis or maybe even something like a transverse myelitis. If they have a very obvious red, hot, and swollen knee or hip with a range of motion that's limited, you are going to worry about this being an infectious arthritis, most likely a septic joint. If it's a small joint on a finger or a toe with limited range of, mo of uh, movement, you might think of tenosynovitis. Uh, if it's multiple joints, you might think about reactive arthritis or in a weird place like the jaw or the clavicle. This might, you, might make you think about chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis or CRMO. Next, when asking about how long this has been going, this can also help you really narrow things down a bit because there's different timelines depending upon the underlying diagnosis. So a septic joint typically um, uh, develops over just a couple of days. Usually these patients have a lot of pain and so they will come in pretty quickly versus uh, the two different types of osteomyelitis. The acute hematogenous osteomyelitis usually develops over a period of a few days but can be as long as a couple of weeks. And then we sort of have drawn a line in the sand for the determining acute osteo versus chronic osteo. And chronic osteo is something that happens over a couple of weeks. As you're asking these questions, you might hear some information that you weren't expecting to hear from the family. They might say, oh, well, this happened after that other thing happened. And you, then you're going to ask, well, what other thing happened? And that might be penetra penetrating trauma, an animal bite, um, a bite at daycare from another child. Or they might mention, well, they had a cold a couple of weeks ago, and now they woke up and they won't move their leg. Uh, you also might hear uh, parents saying, oh, well, this time it happened like this over a few months, but last time it happened like, like over three to four months. And that might raise your antenna for this being an inflammatory process like CRMO. So in the world of infectious diseases, we love when you guys ask an exposure history, and this is a great skill to use in the clinic, um, in the ER. Uh, and this can really help you further narrow down where the foci of infection might be. So for example, if they have a recent sprain, a fall, or trauma, uh, that increases the risk for having an acute hematogenous osteo versus if they had a fracture, you know, after, uh, and then they had that um, fracture operated on, maybe they have a little bit of hardware in place that makes you think about a chronic osteomyelitis. Uh, similarly, recent surgery on a joint um, on a prosthetic joint makes you think of that being infected, or if you're asking more questions around exposure-associated infectious arthritis, like 
Did they go to a Lyme endemic area? Has there been sexual activity that would confer risk for gonorrhea? That can point you in that direction. Similarly, with tenosynovitis, like I mentioned before, it's really dependent upon whatever the inciting event was and the exposures that will be associated with that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in my slide deck. You also want to ask about any recent illnesses in the last month or two, so group A strep. Did they have a sore throat that maybe they didn't go into the doctor and have swabbed? Maybe they had an episode of diarrhea or impetigo. And so this is sort of the list of the different things that we teach our trainees to ask about when it comes to the exposure history. So we covered a lot of these. We talk about travel, out of state, out of country, recent illness, trauma or surgery, sick contacts. You know, maybe the patient themselves didn't have obvious symptoms of group A strep, but their sibling did, and that can kind of give you a clue. We always like to ask about fun activities that everyone is doing, but every fun activity has a little bit of risk, right? So we ask about outdoor stuff, water activities, you know, camping, hiking, all that good stuff. And along with camping and hiking, you will always hear about insect bites. We ask about animal exposures. We ask about funny foods that people are eating, for example, unpasteurized dairy. And we always ask about his or exposure to tuberculosis. So once you've asked those series of questions, you can sort of narrow down on what type of bone and joint infection your patient who has a tactile temperature and refusal to bear weight um, might be having. Uh, sometimes uh, time will tell. You know, for example, a post-infectious uh, arthritis can often just be diagnosed by watching them and um, taking that careful history and having them come in either to the ER or to clinic a couple of days later to see, you know, are they better, have they progressed, or are they worsening? However, a lot of these diagnoses, you're ultimately going to have to get uh, some type of imaging. So the most sensitive type of imaging for most of these um, clinical entities is to do an MRI. Um, if you start with a plain film, that might be helpful if you, for example, are suspecting a septic joint and you want to see if there's an effusion there so that you can go and tap that. That's certainly helpful for, for that um, particular diagnosis. And it can also be helpful for diagnoses um, you know, to show like a you might see a bone lesion, which may point you in a different direction. Um, but unfortunately, the sensitivity of a, um, a plain film for something like osteomyelitis isn't great. And the reason for this is that it takes two weeks for osteomyelitis to show up on a plain film. So since most of our patients are coming in with uh, usually an acute process under that two-week mark, it's uh, much more helpful for us to get an MRI, especially if you're thinking about um, osteomyelitis uh, or tenosynovitis um, versus considering an ultrasound. If you have a big joint, that's easy for you to see you know, if there's fluid in there, that can kind of push you one way or another. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about each of these um, clinical entities a bit more uh, uh, in specific. So the first one I wanted to talk about is acute hematogenous osteo because that's the most common one that we see in our pediatric patient population. And the way that this happens is uh, you become transiently bacteremic, which happens to all of us all the time, and usually our immune system takes care of it. But uh, in, as the bacteria is circulating, uh, it's um, going you know, to all of the different places in the body where there's increased or really good blood flow. So one of those places in children who are growing is the long bones, and they specifically have a lot of blood flow to the metaphysis to support growth, and the sinusoids in this area are really, really slow. Um, and so as the blood flow slows down, the bacteria has the opportunity to kind of like glom onto these areas and lead to an infection. And of course, the risk for this happening is even higher if the patient had a pre-existing trauma that would bring more blood flow to that area because the body is trying to heal that area. Um, so since we know that most of the, the way that, th that acute hematogenous osteomyelitis happens is hematogenously, you're of course going to have uh, blood cultures positive uh, portion of the time. A lot of times when we see the patients in, um, in the clinical setting, it's, uh, it's usually 70% uh, of the time you actually have missed the bacteremia, but it's still a really good idea for you to go ahead and get that blood culture because it will be um, positive about 30% of the time. And if you get an organism, then you can be really good about narrowing and targeting targeting your antibiotics to using the best antibiotic for the job. Um, and then here on the right, I just wanted to show you that um, this is just a schema of the most common places that we see acute hematogenous osteo. And you can see, again, it's the long bones like the femur and the tibia that we um, often see it in. 
Here's just a comparator slide that helps you kind of uh, see the differences between acute hematogenous osteomyelitis and chronic or subacute osteomyelitis. And again, that line that we really want you guys to be asking about when you're doing your history is uh, two weeks in terms of onset of symptoms. Usually the acute patients will have um, more of an obvious I'm infected kind of vibe to them. So they will have fever, pain, quite elevated inflammatory markers. Sometimes their ESR can be like 50 to 80 versus the chronic or the subacute patients. Um, their acute process happened you know, remotely and they've kind of gotten over it and now they have this smoldering infection that requires treatment. But a lot of times they're not febrile. They may have ongoing pain. Um, <clears throat> but they will usually have normal inflammatory markers, so that isn't very helpful for you for the future, but can help you differentiate between these two clinical entities. Um, the organisms, we'll talk about this a little bit more in some um, slides in the, in the future, uh, are far and away due to staph aureus. Um, and most of the staph in children is MSSA, meaning that it is um, susceptible staph. Although you can see in special populations other organisms like in infants, you may see gram-negative rods like E. coli. In people with sickle cell disease, it's still staph, but you might also sometimes see some salmonella or group A strep. Um, versus the chronic or subacute patients, oftentimes this kind of a picture is associated with a recent surgery, with um, hardware that's in a bone. And so not only will you see skin flora, just like we see in acute hematogenous, but you're also going to see higher rates of gram-negative rods, of cons, uh, coagnative staph, or um, C. acnes, which uh, is uh, cutie bacterium acnes, used to be called P. acnes. So when it comes to antibiotic treatment, um, we're going to target our antibiotics towards the most commonly seen bacteria, and that, again, is far and away MSSA, which is why we typically use cefazolin. And one of the most important things about differentiating between acute hematogenous osseo and chronic is the length of therapy that you're going to give those patients. So for acute, there's great data showing that we can now do three to four weeks, so that length of therapy has really shrunk over the last several years. When I was um, training, it was more like six weeks. And now for chronic osteomyelitis, for patients with a relatively uncomplicated course who do not have any hardware, we might start around six weeks, but a lot of these patients end up getting more like 12 weeks, and we'll follow them clinically to help make that determination. Oh, and I just did want to draw your attention to there is a guideline of care um, put out by the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society in 2021, which a lot of kind of the guidance around management comes from. I do want to highlight a couple of things about how we manage here at Seattle Children's. Uh, we have a really great relationship with our orthopedic colleagues, and so we co-manage these patients together when they are admitted um, to the hospital um, by seeing them every day, communicating quite frequently. And then when those patients go home, we alternate visits with our orthopedic team. So one week they'll see ID, and then the next week they'll see ortho, and then the next week they'll see ID. And it's just a great way for us to not only coordinate care, be on the same page, but also be available for these families when questions arise. We also have um, a couple of internal guidelines that help uh, guide best practices. So as the director of COAPI, um, I have about, our division has about 25 internal guidelines and part of my job is to try to get those updated on like a every three year basis. Um, so a big thanks to the, our content experts for our um, osteomyelitis guidelines, which are actually in an update phase right now. So big thanks to Dr. Kronman, um, who owns those guidelines, and our content experts, Dr. Bloomberg, Brenda Eng, and Dr. Bauer. There's going to be some minor updates this year, but this is really just to reflect our current practice. So we're, for example, emphasizing more the clinical exam as the driver of getting our patients discharged from the hospital because they don't need to stay here to follow a CRP if they're doing a whole lot better, and the CRP has really gone down. And then also, we're going to move even further away from home IV antibiotics, also known as OPAT, um, for management of these infections. Um, at, at this institution, we actually haven't used IV antibiotics for management of osteomyelitis in quite a long time. But you may find that uh, you know people who um, trained in the past, that's what they remember doing. Um, I remember doing this when I was a resident. I actually got a phone call from one of our adult ID um, providers at Harborview last week when I was on service who said, OK, I have a patient you know, with osteomyelitis in an adult. I would put a pick in him, and I would do six weeks, and then I'm going to send him to your clinic. And he was like, do I have to do that? And the answer is no. Um, there is really excellent data that 
There is no difference in treatment failure for using an IV antibiotic versus an oral antibiotic for pediatric osteomyelitis, and so that's why we have totally transitioned over to that. And every, most centers that I'm aware of in the pediatric world are doing that too. I did want to take a, a quick detour and just talk a little bit about oral versus IV antibiotics. As I mentioned before, we know that outpatient IV antibiotics or OPAT um, is, leads to a lot of problems. So it causes more adverse drug events. It causes more complications in general for all of the different diagnoses that we use it for. And this study is specific to patients with um, osteomyelitis, and you can see that the treat rates of treatment failure between uh, an oral route and an, a route through an IV at home are uh, the same, so there's no difference there. But you see a little bit more drug reaction in the IV, the home IV antibiotic group, and a lot more treatment um, related events, and this means like problems with their pick where they have to come in and get TPA, or maybe they even need it removed because it's no longer working. So we definitely see this in our practice here at Seattle Children's. Uh, as the Associate Medical Director of ASP, my um, ASP team runs an OPAT program. And uh, we have this dashboard that we've created by um, embedding some smart data stuff within our Epic Notes. And this is a live dashboard um, that helps us follow our outcomes over time. Um, so you can see that you know our we still have complications here at Seattle Children's, and most of these complications are, you know, kind of like minor drug events. For example, someone who had some elevated liver enzymes on their antibiotic, but we see a lot of patients who have problems with their pick, and have to come in and have it fiddled with, or even have it removed. So our goal as a program is actually to get as many patients who previously we would have said, oh, that patient needs OPAT, home IV antibiotics get as many of those indications over to an oral option if there is literature to support that practice. And there's a lot of literature out there. So we're, for example, even thinking about doing this for endocarditis, so stay tuned for an announcement about that soon, following the literature that is out there in the POET trial. Okay, so back on track. We're next gonna start a little, talk a little bit about infectious arthritis. Um, so we'll talk mostly about septic joint because a prosthetic joint infection is something that's uh, more of an adult problem and um, it overlaps uh, pretty significantly with uh, kind of the concepts around hardware associated osteomyelitis and that you're gonna see the same stuff that one might pick up in the OR or be like a slow growing bacteria that comes from skin flora. Um, and so this is more common in adults, but if you work at a pediatric center where you have a lot of um, patients with sickle cell disease, you might end up with some children who have a joint uh, a prosthetic joint and might get infected. And so these patients require a longer length of treatment compared to just like a regular hematogenous septic joint. So for a regular septic joint, they look uh, a lot like a acute hematogenous osteomyelitis in that they're, they'll have a fever, a lot of pain, and elevated inflammatory markers. And it's very important that we figure out what's going on with these patients and do a drainage procedure right away because if that infection continues in that um, very compressed joint capsule, they could have um, damage of their joint. The bugs are similar, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but far and away, it's staph, and our staph here is mostly um, MSSA, like at most pediatric centers. Um, one thing that is different is that in, uh, in toddlers, you might see um, bacteria like Kingella kingae, uh, which is a um, gram-negative rod that, that's fastidious, so it doesn't grow in culture very well, but you still have to think about it. And you might also see things like pneumococcus and Hib if your patient is not vaccinated. And then for the teens, you might see things like gonorrhea. So like uh, for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, we can get away with three to four weeks of oral therapy for a septic joint after the patient has defervesced and is doing well. Um, so for septic joint, the microbiology, as I mentioned, we see a lot of uh, MSSA, um, and we do see some other uh, different um, things growing, but uh, one of the things I think is important to point out is that your yield from your culture is not gonna be as good as it may be from an acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. So your blood culture may only give you a um, organism about 20% of the time, so a lot of times we are working without data, and the joint fluid culture similarly only gives you um, an answer about 40% of the time, and anecdotally, I think it's probably less than that. 
And then just like epidemiologically, I just wanted to show you that the um, joints that tend to be most infected are the knee and the hip. Okay, so I wanted to take a minute to do a quick exercise just to think about choosing therapy. So we talked a bit about the microbiology and one of the most important things um, to do any place that you work is to understand when you're choosing antibiotics and you think that it's probably due to staff to have an understanding of the rates of MRSA at your institution. So the best way to do this is to look at your local antibiogram. Our local antibiogram, you can reach it at the link at the bottom. It's very easy to get to. This is just like a screenshot of um, specifically the, the staph aureus numbers. Um, ours is uh, broken out into uh, not CF patients and patients with CF, so I'm just showing you the, the, the um, community patients here. You can see that our general rates of MRSA in our community patients is about 16%. And there are other institutions where they may have a higher rate of MRSA. So this is really helpful because it really helps you figure out what impure coverage, assuming that you don't have a positive culture, which most of the time we don't, you're going to choose for a septic joint. So for example, cephalexin or cefazolin, it doesn't give you any MRSA coverage and it does cover Kingella, which is very helpful because um, if your patient, for example, is on something like uh, like clindamycin, which has no Kingella coverage, and they're not getting better, then you have to ask yourself, okay, are they not getting better because they have Kingella and I just can't tell? Or are they not getting better because they need, for example, a more invasive surgical procedure like an IND instead of just putting a needle in the joint, which a lot of patients do need, and our orthopedic team are the experts at figuring that out. But it's always easiest if you can um, start with a, a drug that, um, covers the most common things that you're going to see. So some um, places may elect to do clindamycin for most of their patients, although the side effect, of course, is, um, is kind of uh, decreasing your good bacteria in the gut and increasing your risk for C. diff. And then there are other places that also use Bactrim or Trim Sulfa. So I think the point that I want to make here is that when you're making your antibiotic choice, it's just really important that you choose empirically based on your local antibiogram patient-specific risk factors. So for example, if the patient tells you, oh yeah, my mom had MRSA last year, you're probably gonna wanna cover MRSA in that, in that patient. And so it's always great to ask questions around MRSA risk factors, which include you know, if the patient or anyone in the patient's family works in healthcare, works in a different congregate setting like a nursing home, if they have bumps or boils or ingrown hairs, um, those are uh, risk factors that should make you think about whether or not your patient is colonized for MRSA. And of course, whenever you're choosing an antibiotic, you want to know what your holes are, what you're missing. Because if your patient isn't going to get better, you need to go back to the patient and say, OK, it, could it be one of these things that is falling through the cracks of the antibiotic coverage I have chosen? And then change your plan if that's what's happening. And I did want you guys to be aware that um, given that the culture positivity rate for septic arthritis is quite low, there are some centers where they're developing a multiplex PCR from the synovial fluid to see if we can get more rapid diagnostics around um, knowing what the, uh, uh, what the organism is uh, in these situations. And so that's in development. And we will see um, if that's something that becomes uh, commonly used um, in, in medicine. Okay, so sometimes we get a phone call after we've given our recommendations that the patient should be on um, cefazolin, and we get a question about, oh, hey, we heard that the patient is penicillin allergic. Can they still get uh, cephalosporin? Um, and the answer is that they can. You know, kind of depending upon where you trained, you might be more or less comfortable with this idea. I think here we're relatively more comfortable with it, but it doesn't matter what we're comfortable with. What matters is the data. So if you look at this meta-analysis, which was just published, I want to say, in 2021 by some famous um, allergists in the field, along with some surgeons who do some penicillin allergy work, uh, the rate of um, uh, cephalosporin allergy in a group of penicillin allergic patients was 0.7%. So less than 1%. And there's, uh, this was a big group of patients. This was 6,000 people. So I mean, there's a lot of other studies that um, show the same thing. And this is just all of those studies summed up together. So we feel very, very comfortable giving a cephalosporin to a patient who is penicillin allergic. But we would also recommend that you guys think about when you're dealing with these patients, well, is their penicillin allergy a true allergy? Um, and the reason that I say this is we know that most patients who say that they are penicillin allergic actually don't have any reaction at all if we give them a dose of oral amoxicillin. 
And it might be that we know that 80% of people with a real penicillin allergy, they grew out of those after 10 years. It also could be that maybe your patient was diagnosed with a penicillin allergy when they were two years old and they had some URI symptoms and then someone gave them a dose of amoxicillin because the ears looked a little red and then they had a big rash and it turned out it was just a viral exanthem but there was no way at the time to really tell those two things apart so they just ended up with that label in the chart. Um, so in order to try to find these patients and to um, remove the penicillin allergy label. There's a lot of QI projects out there in the world, in the PEDS ID world, but also at the statewide level to do this. Um, and so there's great literature now that you actually don't even need to do the skin test where you do like a scratch test for uh, penicillin for select patients who are low risk. And that's actually like most patients. It's like 70 to 80 patients, if not more, 80% of patients, if not more. Um, we can skip that and we can just give them an oral challenge. And so if you guys have patients um, that you're seeing here at Seattle Children's, we actually have a process by which we can do this. We have a screening process, we have an oral challenge process, it's rolled out for inpatients, and you can um, read about that here at the links at the bottom. And of course, if you have questions, this is run through our antimicrobial stewardship team, so please do not hesitate to um, ask us about this. We're always happy to take questions. And then if you're still kind of concerned about uh, cephalosporin and um, a penicillin allergy, you know, there are a lot of references out there that help us really understand, you know, like what is, like which, for patients who do have uh, potential for cross-reactivity, um, which drug combos actually have cross-reactivity, and it has to do with the molecular um, structure of penicillins and cephalosporins, and it kind of depends upon this side chain right here and whether or not they look like each other. So there's like a table that you can reference that tells you which combos are okay and which combos carry that 0.7% of risk. And if you have questions about it, please let our pharmacists know because they're happy to work with you guys and, and do some education around that. Oh, and then there's also gonna be a, um, this year World Antibiotic Awareness Week is always um, in late November. And this year, the Washington Department of Health actually has chosen penicillin allergy delabeling as their theme. And so if you're wanting to learn more about it or talk to your patients about it, check out their website in a couple of weeks. Okay, so moving on from that detour, um, we're now going to talk about this vignette. And I have a bunch of slides that I had a lot of fun making about this topic. Okay, so this is a phone call, an exact phone call I got a year ago from someone at OBCC, a, a physician there, who said, hey, I have this patient. Um, it, it was December-ish, and over the summer, he went and he visited grandma in Maine. They ran around, you know, her backyard, and he was covered in ticks, but he was fine. Um, and then he came back to school in, you know, the, in September and had a brief febrile illness, and so did his sister, so, you know, we just thought he had a cold. But then in December, he was just having some decreased range of movement of his hip, even though he looked totally fine. So he saw sports medicine and they prescribed rest and stretches and it did not get better. So her question is, could this be Lyme arthritis? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it could be. Um, here's just some um, tick identify, uh, identification pictures here in uh, Seattle. We have the Western black-legged tick, which is Ixoides pacificus. Okay, so how common is Lyme arthritis um, and how common is Lyme in general in um, our area here in the Pacific Northwest? It is very uncommon. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you guys about it today is because we have, we get a lot of questions about it and um, a lot of confusion, especially if you've trained your whole life here, you know, you're not gonna have seen it very much. And so I just wanted to kind of run through some um, basics about what we might do for a patient with um, Lyme arthritis and, and um, and some risk factors for that. Okay, so like I mentioned, most of the cases in Washington state are actually um, travel associated, meaning someone went to Maine and then they came back and then they developed symptoms. Um, this um, uh, table here comes from the Washington State Department of Health and this is public access, like you can just Google it and they have all of the case rates for lots of different infectious diseases going back, you know, like 30 years. So it's really fun when you guys call us and you say, okay, how much Campylobacter have we had in this state? And this is what I do. I just go to this website and we take a look at these numbers. Um, and so you can see that you know, it's not very common here and what their website says is they think there's either zero or like maybe a handful of patients every year who have acquired it locally and that they have no history of travel to an endemic area. And 
those cases are mostly coming from west of the Cascades. But we know that the incidence has been increasing. Um, and this is just a reminder of the life cycle of um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a spirochete that causes um, Lyme disease. And it's just carried um, by, uh, by the tick, which then passes it amongst different types of hosts and eventually incidental, incidental, incidental hosts, which are um, us humans. OK, so I wanted to take yet another detour and talk a bit about infectious diseases and climate change because it's a really, really fun topic and really has to do with the increase in Lyme disease that we're seeing. So on those, these two maps, you can see that between 2001 and 2020, the rates of Lyme disease have really increased. There are some counties in the Northeast where the rates of Lyme disease have um, tripled, um, which is um, pretty telling. Um, and we know that this has to do uh, in some part because of climate warming. So ticks can just live in new places that used to be way too cold. And the shorter winters means that there's more time for people to be interacting with ticks while they're outside in the outdoors and to get infected. And whenever there's uh, climate change, like specifically climate warming, you're going to have more food that is being grown. This increases the host population, and that leaves, leads to better tick survival and transmission. Um, and then we also have kind of the infringement of human populations on forested land, which has really changed since the 80s. This is just yet another graph showing the incidence in cases per 100,000 and how much that has truly increased over the last 30 years. OK, so I want you guys to bear with me a little bit while I talk a little bit more about this intersection between infectious diseases and climate change, because I think it's really interesting. And if you guys are not a denizen of the internet, this meme is just sort of like a, something that people use to say, OK, this sounds crazy, but listen. OK, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was on social media, and I saw this video come across on my social media, because this is like a, um, a TikToker that I like to follow. She's like super fun to watch. She uh, won a James Beard last year, and she was talking about how this year in Columbus, Ohio, which is where she's from, it, it's been a really good acorn year. And so uh, what that's called is a mast year. So what happens is all of the acorns, they decide that they're going to make, a, uh, the, all the oaks decide that they're going to make a ton of acorns, like a huge amount, and they drop them all at the same time. And then the next year, will be a bust year, and they'll make like no acorns. And then a couple of years after that, it'll be kind of average, and then this will happen again. So what does this have to do with infectious diseases? Great question. Um, it has to do with this mouse and how much this mouse likes to eat acorns. Um, and then I also, as I was reading about this and putting together this talk, asked myself, well, I wonder if other places around the country are having a, a mass year for oaks and uh, in the Midwest and in the Northeast, it is actually a really big uh, acorn production year. And the jury's out about um, the Pacific Northwest, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, this is, this is where um, the connection happens. So when there is a mass year, which can happen due to climate change, when there's a mild winter, there aren't any spring freezes, there's maybe a lot of uh, rain, there's ni nice and balmy conditions before the oak tree flowers, you're gonna produce a ton of acorns. So that looks like it's gonna happen, it's this year, right? And then what happens is all of the white-footed mice, which love to eat the acorns, get a lot of extra calories, and then they produce a ton of babies, and so the next year, the mouse population just like goes out of control. Um, and what happens is these uh, mice are a carrier for Borrelia, um, and ticks will predate them and overwinter, and then the next year those ticks will go on to bite us. And so then the following year, there'll be a really um, bad year for Lyme disease. So this is a known phenomenon. I did not make it up. Um, it happened in 2012. It happened in 2017. And I'm going to put money on this happening in 2025. So please call us when you need help. We are always happy to answer questions about this. And you might ask me, well, there's not a lot of native oaks in the Pacific Northwest. And you would be correct. This is on the right-hand side just like a um, schema of stands of native oaks um, in the United States. And you could see that the only native oak that we have here is the Gary Oak. Um, and it, there's not a whole lot of it, to be honest. So I actually asked, I have like a gardening group online, and I asked them, have you guys noticed a lot of acorns falling? And like half the responses were like, there aren't oaks here. Why are you asking that? But then some people said they went camping in some of these red areas, and yeah, they actually had a ton of acorns. So time will tell. 
Anyway, so this is sort of getting at this theme of that intersection between infectious diseases and climate change. And honestly, it is like the most fun part for me of being an infectious disease doctor because you learn a little entomology, you learn about forest ecology, you learn about pyroaerobiology, which is like a thing. Um, and it's just really, really fun to understand the intersection between our environment, the pathogens that cause disease, um, and how this can affect our lives. Okay, so what do you actually do with that kid who you think has Lyme arthritis, right? Well, please call us. And what you're going to do is you're gonna send a Lyme antibody with reflex to either, depending upon how your lab labels it, an ELISA, an immunoblot, or a Western blot. And if that's positive, you'll call us and we'll talk about maybe doing an ultrasound. If you're, this, this um, Lyme antibody with reflex, it can be quite confusing for people to interpret. Um, and essentially what's happening is that someone is doing an immunoblot and they're getting these bands and um, those bands sort of like correlate to the likelihood that your patient has antibodies against Borrelia. Um, and if you look in the red book, the red book has names of the bands and they're all named things like P90 or you know like just random combinations of letters and numbers and you have to count how many are positive and that helps you determine if it's a true positive. And the reason I wanted to explain this is that um, Sometimes the labs are not very good at um, explaining that, like in the report that you get, and so you might it might look positive, but then when you go and you count, it could be that they only have two bands, and it turns out you need five bands, and they have to be labeled X, Y, Z. So this is where people get very tripped up in the community, and we are very happy to go over those results with you, um, with the Red Book open, of course, because none of us have those memorized. Okay. So once you've decided that this patient has Lyme arthritis, of course, we would love to see them in clinic or to provide um, some guidance for you over the phone if that's not possible. Uh, but typically, the recommendation for treatment for these patients is a month of or oral doxycycline, or if you're less than eight years old, you can do amoxicillin. And way far in the past, we used to do IV ceftriaxone for these patients, but now we know that with the really uh, highly bioavailable oral antibiotics, we don't need to do that anymore, and we actually don't even need to do it if you told me that you had Lyme in someone's brain. We can do orals for that too. Um, now, there are some patients with Lyme arthritis who don't have a perfect response to the one month of antibiotics, and you might actually have to repeat the course, and that's, of course, something that we will help with. And then after that, there's even 10 to 15% of patients who have a persistent synovitis. And this is most, more of like a inflammatory synovitis that's like really um, tied to whether or not that patient is HLA B27 positive. Um, and for those patients, they might need some immunologic modulation. So we send them to our wonderful rheumatology colleagues. Now you might ask yourself, hold up, my dog is vaccinated against Lyme. How come I'm not vaccinated against Lyme? And that is a great question. There was a um, Lyme vaccine that was on the market. It was pulled off the market basically due to patient drama. Um, and it seems that in retrospective studies, it, it seemed to have worked and was well tolerated, but there was just like a lot of um, problems with kind of the anti-vax movement at the time. But since there is renewed interest, there is a Lyme vaccine that is currently in development. It is uh, several months into um, phase three trials. This is just the, the one on the left is the write-up of the phase one trial, which just showed that it had good immunogenicity. This was published last month. This is just a um, announcement from the company that their phase two trial seemed to go well. And this is kind of a screenshot from um, clinicaltrials.gov that gives you the details about the phase three trial. And then there also is a um, biologic that is in development that is moving forward into uh, phase two and three trials soon. So hopefully a vaccine is coming. Um, we'll cross our fingers for that. Okay, so we're done with that detour. We're gonna come back to our roadmap and as quickly as I can, we're gonna get through some of these other slides and we might run through them um, a little on the faster side, but they will be there for you guys to reference um, for the future. Okay, so at the beginning I mentioned tenosynovitis is one of those bone and joint infections that you um, might see in clinic or in the ER. 
it's usually of the hands. Sometimes you do see it in the feet, and it's usually because of inoculation or extension from some type of a puncture wound, and that might be someone stepped on a nail or they were bitten. And usually you have not only pain and swelling, but you're not able to extend or flex a digit. And ultimately, most of these patients need some type of imaging to really elucidate the details. Um, the microbiology is really going to depend upon their exposure, right? So for an animal bite, you might see pasturella. For a human bite, the classic one is to get iconella. Um, you might also have water exposure, um, in which case you could grow a lot of weird things. And so the treatment is really going to depend upon the mechanism of injury, which is why you need to ask patients what they think happened. Um, a good starting point is to, is to start them on amoxicillin cl clavulanate and also talk to your surgical colleagues because some of these patients might require surgical intervention. Okay, now moving on to post-infectious arthritis. Uh, one of the questions that we get a lot is kind of how to differentiate between a septic arthritis and a reactive arthritis. One of the ways that you can do this is that a reactive arthritis um, sometimes uh, gets more than a couple of joints involved and is usually one to four weeks following either a diarrheal illness which, with some classic um, bacteria or, or a few weeks following urethritis. And then um, sometimes you can kind of conflate reactive arthritis with post-streptococcal reactive arthritis, which is more of a migratory arthritis, and it's usually a shorter period of time after a known strep infection. Um, here's some uh, different uh, uh, ways that people have tried to help really differentiate a post-infectious arthritis from a septic joint. There's lots of different criteria that are out there, and you can see that like the more variables that you can check off, the higher the likelihood of septic arthritis. And if you look at these variables, most of them are kind of in the neighborhood of fever, elevated inflammatory markers, and not being able to bear weight on the joint. So that's one clue that can help you differentiate between the two. And another one for patients who are in the ER have been found to have an effusion and then get that effusion tapped and sent for cell counts. Another clue is the number of white blood cells that you have from that joint fluid and kind of the percentage of those white blood cells that are um, neutrophils or PMNs. Um, so it's course, of course it's going to be higher, higher for a bacterial arthritis and lower for a reactive arthritis. But that being said, there can be some overlap and um, these criteria are not um, incredibly uh, specific. And so this can be a bit challenging sometimes to interpret, but it's yet one more clue that you can use to differentiate the two. We also sometimes get questions about um, acute rheumatic fever, which is typically a migratory polyarthritis, and there's very specific criteria to meet in order to make this diagnosis. It's quite rare in places like Washington that um, are well-resourced, so you'll see this more often in um, developing nations that don't have as much access to care for you know, just like a strep throat infection. But intermittently, we will see this. For example, we had a case a couple of weeks ago and actually received a call from a PMD, PMD a week ago that really sounded like acute rheumatic fever, so we will find out when some of those um, results come back. But the way that I typically deal with these questions that we get quite often over the phone is kind of to recommend a list of labs and tests that get at the revised Jones criteria. So we always recommend to do an, um, either a group A strep swab, or if it's too late, both an ASO and an anti-DNA B. and the reason for this is an ASO or an anti-DNA B on its own is not very specific for um, helping us understand when a strep infection happened, but if we have both of those and they're both sky high, then that's a lot more specific for helping us understand if they are at a higher risk for acute rheumatic fever. You'll, of course, want to check inflammatory markers. Typically, for acute rheumatic fever, they're quite high. And then from there, you're going to go down the Jones criteria, which uh, includes carditis. So you're going to ask about chest pain. And it can be silent carditis. So a lot of these patients ultimately need an EKG and an echo to see if they have signs of valvulitis. Uh, you're going to ask about choreiform movements. There's some great videos on YouTube. I'll just pull it up and show it to the parent and be like, are they doing a thing like this? They're quite distinctive. So if they have chorea and they have no other symptoms, that actually makes your diagnosis. Um, and then you're going to ask also about subcutaneous nodules and a rash called erythema marginatum.
Okay, here's my last couple of slides. So one of the last clinical entities that we think about in a patient who you are examining for a possible bone and joint infection is this clinical entity called chronic recurrent multifocal osteom osteomyelitis or chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis, which we call CRMO. This will look like a subacute osteomyelitis. The cultures are negative. The patient may or may not get better on antibiotics, and often they won't like get better enough. And then it'll happen again, and the parent will be like, this is the second time that we're having to deal with this. And that should just raise your suspicion that this is more of an inflammatory process that needs to be referred to rheumatology, and those patients often need um, immunologic modulation. So to diagnose these, the uh, rheumatology CRMO program does actually a full body MRI, and you can see um, Dr. Zhao, who runs that program, sent me the slide. You can see that as soon as they started doing whole body diagnosis, uh, MRI, it really increased the rates of being able to pick up on this condition. And we know that the incidence is really increasing over time, and we don't know if that's uh, because of other factors or because we're just diagnosing it a lot better. So fortunately, here at Seattle Children's, we have this amazing CRMO program. They have um, created a uh, this algorithm to help you determine what to do for patients for whom you're thinking about CRMO and sort of how to refer them to their program. And they've also created a lot of really wonderful um, patient education and supportive um, literature out there that is open access. And so you can take a look at uh, this literature here and share those with your patients for whom you are thinking about this being a diagnosis. All right, and to close, I just wanted to share a couple of resources with you all. So um, if you're wanting to do more reading, there's a lot of really wonderful places to go and read about um, osteomyelitis and arthritis. You'll notice a local celebrity was on this publication right here. Um, and then I also have some additional references. I did want to um, say a big thank you to everyone who has supported me getting here today. And I am happy to take questions. I was just shocked to see the slide for acute hematological spread of osteo that only 30% of the time we have a positive blood culture. So I didn't realize that. So 70% of the time, are we just treating kids assuming it's staph aureus? Yeah, so um, often that, so definitely if they do not get a surgical procedure, a lot of um, places, uh, if they on the MRI see that there's like a fluid collection or they suspect that there is um, a, like a collection of pus there that is helpful for the orthopedist to go in and wash out, then we'll get a sample from that. And usually those have a pretty decent yield, but they, they don't always grow. So yeah, you're right. Most of the time we are operating without specific data for that patient. Can I ask more about the logistics of the delabeling program that yeah. we have here? Because mm -hmm. I think a few of us will be sending people over there. Yeah, um, we would love to um, have you um, use that service. Um, so right now there is a, um, a patient screener that puts your patient into a risk level for true anaphylaxis to a, a penicillin that is available in the admission navigator, not only for physicians, but for RNs and also for pharmacists. And so if you're a physician and you're like, I need to figure out if I can give this patient an oral amoxicillin challenge, it will tell you that. So it's a nine question questionnaire that has radio buttons and it'll automatically calculate for you the risk level. And you'll also get an automatic um, handout with like what to do next that shows up in your in basket. Um, it shows up in the in basket of the person that's labeled as a first contact provider. Um, and then if it sounds like your patient is a candidate for an oral amoxicillin challenge, there's an order set that you can order that has the specifics about, you know, how, what the dose is, um, that the nurse has to sit with them for, I think it's 30 minutes and do a couple of sets of vitals that, you know, they will have epi at the bedside in case they need that. Um, and there's also a lot of like policies and procedures in case you have nursing colleagues who haven't done the, um, an oral amoxicillin challenge before. So it's basically available. Um, you know, at your request, uh, and there are two floors on which we are asking that the nurses fill out the screener for every patient that gets admitted with a penicillin allergy, and that's Med R4 and Med F3, and we're hoping to um, expand that pilot um, in the coming months. That's outstanding. And do you have any numbers yet for how many people have been de-labeled? Yeah, I de think we de-labeled something like um, 40 patients. Um, this was a, a project that I did for QI Scholars, which I did a couple of years ago, and I gave sort of a very brief um, update uh, over about 10 minutes at Grand Rounds in May. And, and actually, I'm going to give a summary of this entire 
project um, for that um, the Washington State Department of Health's Antibiotic Awareness Week. They're doing a several seminars talking about different ways you can do penicillin allergy delabeling, and we're one of the projects that was highlighted. So tune into that, and you'll have a lot more details. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the plug. That's great. Any other questions in the room? Online, we just have a bunch of thank yous, and we learn so much, which we really appreciate, too. No? No? I was expecting. Yeah. That's what I was expecting, but I didn't want to pressure you. Um, I know <clears throat> some of the providers in the infectious disease division really love the CRP. Um, do, you, do you have a, a feeling uh, that you'd like to share with us about the CRP? Is there a magic number mm -hmm. when you're treating a bone and joint infection? Is there a magic number or a specific trend that you use? Yeah, um, there is not a magic number. Um, historically, we have made up a magic number, and that magic number has been under two, but that is, um, you know, not evidence-based, and we just did it because people like to have, you know, specific guidance, um, and so that's why we really rely on not only the CRP decreasing, ideally, by 50% of the peak number, but more importantly, the patient's clinical exam. So I recently, I think last weekend, I was on service for a while. I had a patient who, to me, looked totally fine, and they had a CRP of 3.4, and um, the patient's primary team was like, well, I, win, I wanna keep her one more day. Um, and I, I wish that I had advocated more to have that patient discharge because I think she probably would have been a candidate. But, you know, so much of it is sheer decision-making between us, the primary team, the orthopedist, and the family. Thank you. Yeah. A few questions online. This is Indy. What are your thoughts on discharging children from the ED with acute osteo on PO cephalexin without admitting them? Assuming clinically well overall, CRP very low, MRI has been reviewed by ortho and they feel no operative intervention needed, not immunocompromised, usual caveats, et cetera. Yeah, that's a, a great idea. I snickering in the front row for yeah, Indy. Yeah, <laughs> snickering in the front row. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think that that's a great way to decrease an unnecessary or remove an unnecessary hospital away for a family. And I think my Indy mentioned kind of the caveats that we would have for that situation. But like the only other caveat that I would recommend is it's imperative that these patients show up in clinic. So they really need to have good follow up definitely with their PMD within like two to three days. And I think really importantly with us in infectious disease clinic, and the reason for that is that a lot of times these patients are going home on every eight hours antibiotics and families can get kind of confused about that and may not understand that it's like truly important to wake up your child to give them an antibiotic every eight hours. And we do sometimes see treatment failure if patients are kind of accidentally giving their child antibiotics every 12 hours. So I think that's the main risk that we would have to make uh, sure that the patient has um, that follow-up, that they have access to care if there's someone who has some SCOH challenges. Um, but if all of those perfect things are in place, I think it's a total possibility. Thank you. And thanks, Indy, for the question. And one more from Donna Denno. Great talk. If we have a patient in the outpatient primary care setting labeled with a penicillin allergy and we'd like to get that confirmed or refuted, is there an outpatient delabeling service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we just actually had some conversations with Clara Lynn, who's our CMIO, about potentially getting this built for the outpatient module. Um, one of the challenges is that kind of like the stuff that is built in the inpatient world needs to be kind of like rebuilt to a degree in the outpatient world. So we're hoping that that's something that we can potentially build during 2024. Um, but right now, kind of the easiest way to um, to help your patients um, potentially get screened and delabeled is to refer your patients to the allergy clinic. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the front or back? No? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Konal. This was a really, really educational hour. We're so glad we got you to come speak for us today. And we'll see everybody next week. Thank you so much for all your work, everybody.